Before I was ordained, I was a very good pastor, wildly superior to my cranky pastor elders. You know the type, the old curmudgeon who makes unfortunate fashion choices, who complains and criticizes and preaches the same limping sermon week after week, counting the council meetings until retirement. I remember boasting to an equally inexperienced colleague, I will never be like that. <laughs> Would you be surprised to learn that 32 years into the business, I now understand how a pastor gets like that. I'm not there yet, but I've seen the trailhead to that path. Before I had children, I was a very good parent. My children would never suffer snot sickles on the playground. I would never yell, I'll give you something to cry about. More starkly, before I had children, I never understood how a parent could harm a child. But one cold winter night 30 years ago when my infant daughter did nothing but cry for 12 hours, and I was so tired, I couldn't stand up straight, I understood. I didn't harm her, but I got a glimpse of how an otherwise loving parent who was alone, impoverished or anxious, might do something unwise. I knew so little, but I thought I knew so much. The Sunday, Sunday after Epiphany is always celebrated as baptism of our Lord. It's a bit confusing to the average person since the last time most of us were together for worship. Jesus, who on Christmas Eve looked a lot like Finn Dolman, <laughs> was resting uneasily in the manger. In fact, Jesus tried to crawl out a couple times, actually. But neither the lectionary nor the early church were much interested in Jesus' birth. The gospel writer Mark doesn't even mention it. So we follow Mark's lead when we start the year, not with a baby shower, but with a baptismal shower. Because it was on a watery day at the River Jordan that Jesus' life suddenly got very interesting, that his ministry started and the world sat up and took notice. Jesus' baptism raises all sorts of interesting theological questions. Did he know he was the Son of God before the dove pooped on his head? Did John the baptizer know Jesus was anything more than his second cousin once removed? Why was Jesus baptized at all if he is the sinless Son of God? And does Jesus' baptism as an adult put the lie to our practice of baptizing infants? There is not time here to address all those really interesting questions. But at the root of them is a single question, not unlike the question that Watergate made famous. What did you know, and when did you know it? More specifically, what did Jesus know? What did John know? What do we know? For an answer, we turn to the great 20th century theologian and former Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, notorious for his awkward observations and his wincing syntax. He once famously said, there are known knowns, does anybody remember this line? There are known knowns, these are things that we know, there are known unknowns, that is to say, there are things that we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we don't even know we don't know. <laughs> Though wildly mocked for this clumsy insight, he was not wrong. In most aspects of our lives, we don't even know what we don't know. It's true of pastoring. It's certainly true of parenting. And it is also true of the life of faith. With your permission, I will give the gospel only a glancing blow. This is the third time in six weeks that I've dealt with John the baptizer. I've spent more time with him than with my own family. So the text that catches my interest today is the second reading, the reading from Acts. 
only a handful of years after Jesus' ministry, death, and resurrection. The early evangelists were literally beating bushes and climbing mountains to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to distant lands. There was no common text. There was no canon of best practices. It was the wild, wild west of Christianity. Every evangelist had a different interpretation. Every community had different needs. It was every hearer for herself. When today's reading opens, Paul is evangelizing alone along the Aegean Sea when he comes upon a small pocket of disciples. Actually, it was more a pouch than a pocket. There were not very many of them. He didn't even know they were there. Had some other peripatetic preacher gotten to that village before him? Had they been in Jerusalem at some point and heard about Jesus and brought the news home? Again, we don't know. But regardless of the way they first learned about Jesus, their knowledge of him was paltry at best. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized, Paul asked? To which they responded, what? So Paul baptized them on the spot, not with John's baptism and with no mention of water. There might have been, but nobody says there was. So how did he baptize them? What is Jesus' baptism? With holy hands on their head and in Jesus' name. That's how he baptized them. That small bag of believers didn't even know what they didn't know, but under the warmth of Paul's calloused hands and at the sound of Jesus' name, they burst into speech, speaking in languages they didn't even know. Is it possible that we don't even know what we don't know about baptism, about believing? Absolutely. I've told you before that being a pastor is very awkward in social settings. People either confess to me or complain to me. I've learned all sorts of stories I really don't need to know. But I also get questions from people who are casual observers, sort of armchair Christians who like to play stump the chump in public settings. I don't mind talking about the faith, probing deep questions. But when for people it's just sort of a casual thing to see how stupid they can make me look, how quickly they ask, is there a sin so great it cannot be forgiven? What about Hitler, right? That's the big question. What happens to us after we die? Why does God allow suffering? Because their questions in those settings are typically so casual, they get a casual answer. No, don't know, wrong question, I'll have another scotch. But those who are immersed in the faith, who truly want to know God, who really want to believe, who struggle to be faithful, know that certainty is the enemy of faith. It is in not knowing that we follow most If we knew the challenges that lay ahead of us, if we knew what suffering meant, if we knew the limits of God's love, if there are any, if we knew how it all started and how it will all end, we would not need to follow at all. There would be no unknowns, only knowns. And our lives would be sadly predictable. And Jesus, Jesus would be looking for work. But when we admit that we don't even know what we don't know, we make a space for God to enter, to do things in our lives and in our hearts, in our world that we would not have imagined for ourselves. Jesus invites questions, but does not always provide a good answer. But he does give us joy beyond anything we imagined possible. 
and courage when we are too weak to stand, and hope when the way ahead is only dark. I am a better pastor. I am a better parent when I acknowledge my limitations. And we are all better disciples when we admit how much we don't know. What is God doing in our lives? What does this mean? And the answer is, I don't know. But we don't have to, because God does.